Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. I'm Bob, how's it going? Welcome back to another comparison video. This time we're looking at what I consider still all mountain skis, yep. but in the mid 80 waist width range. Yeah, and we're starting to see like true front side shapes creeping in, but yep. still in that wider bodied format. Yeah, and not all front side shapes are right. here. There's still a good mix of different shapes and different characteristics on this wall and a huge range of prices. Yep. Um, and we are going to go in the order of least expensive to most expensive. Yep. And there's a pretty big difference between this side of the wall and that side of the wall. There sure is. At least the extremities. <laughs> We've got about a thousand dollar range in prices up here. Pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. The yep. other thing that we did in this category, um, which is a little bit unique, is there are a lot of skis up here that come with bindings. I think there are Mm -hmm. A little less than eight, half, yeah. I think eight total skis that come with bindings when you buy them. So in order to kind of accurately or consistently go by that price organization, um, we did what, what I call net cost. Yep. So I basically took the cost of the binding, if you were to buy that system binding as a standalone binding and they're there is an equivalent standalone binding for pretty much everything yep. up here. So we took that price, subtracted it from the overall price, um, and that's kind of the order that we're going into. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to do it. I do too. Yep. I think it's the, the most fair way. Um, and if you're interested, you know, you can check the site and, and look at the price with yep. the binding, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, a lot of cool skis up here. And we were just chatting about it. Um, both Bob and I think that this category doesn't really see, receive the attention that it deserves. Yeah, they're not. It's not quite as sexy as the wider skis in the marketing. Totally, the or the narrower the skis. Yep, true. There's like this gap. You know, we we as skiers we're somewhat ego driven, yep. and you know, you look at the narrower kind of race influenced front side skis, which we'll get to in, in a future comparison super high-end ski is really powerful and then you start seeing more high-end stuff in like the mid 90 or 90 on up yep. range and that leaves this mid 80 category just kind of lost yeah and we're ranging from 83 to 88 so yep. there are a few 88s here that kind of crossed over between our 90 yep. comparison um, and then there's a few like 82s like uh, brahma 82 is missing off of this Correct. wall um, so any of those 82s will go into that 80 millimeter range. But, yep. um, you know, there are skis up here that end up being 88 millimeters underfoot at the longer lengths. And like some people might even consider that to be too wide for certain applications. So right. it's, yeah, a huge range of stuff in here. And just really, I feel like when people are honest with themselves about what they actually ski, that something on this wall is likely going to fit what they do in reality. I think so, too. Yeah, I think there's a lot to like about skis in this range. Yeah. Um, I think with that, we can just get right into it. Sure. So over here on this end, um, we have the Bent 85. So this is the narrowest ski in the new Atomic um, Bent kind of expanded collection. Yep. Also, before I go super in-depth on this ski, we're not going to focus as much on weights in this comparison. We will look at some skis and, and their weight, but with those integrated bindings on some skis, it, it, it's, it's a tough comparison by weight. Yeah, so. and we can point out when things are notoriously light or heavy. Right, and I think this is a, this is a good one to point out um, because it does have different construction than the other bent skis, so it is a little bit heavier. Uh, what length are you holding there, Bob? 170? 170. So we're almost to 1,800 grams in that ski. Um, and at that length, that is a little bit heavier than even the Bent 90. Yeah. And that's because in this ski, we're using a mix of wood core and a denso light material. So more of a synthetic yeah. construction to this ski. And then there are more differences between the Bent 85 and the Bent 90 as well. Um, there's no more Horizon Tech in this ski. So just flat bases, yep. flat tips and tails. We also get full cap construction or what I consider full cap construction. There's a little bit of vertical sidewall underfoot, but I would say it's still more cap than vertical, even right underfoot. Yeah, I'd say that's like just for show. Exactly, right. So very simplistic build here. 
um, cap constructions designed to increase durability. And there's a couple really good applications for this ski. If you're just looking for a fun, versatile, affordable all-mountain ski, I think it can work really well. Yep. Just for a directional skier who doesn't have super high demands or very specific demands, like it's very affordable. Yep. You know, you're not going to break the bank. There, you don't have to overthink it. You can pick up a ski like this for a pretty low price, including a binding. You know, if you were to pair a binding on here, you'd be in what the 450 range or 550 range if you went with an inexpensive binding. Yep. Because this ski, on its own, is 399, which is a crazy deal. Like I think that's super yeah. incredible for a 2023 ski with relatively modern yeah. shaping and technology. Yep. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up that shaping because we do still get tip and tail rocker in this ski, even though we don't have Horizon Tech. There is still a good amount of tip and tail rocker. Um, so really fun, just simple, easy going, yep. all mountain ski. Um, the other good application for this ski is as a park ski. Um, a couple of the kids that I coached last season or that I have coached for a, a few seasons now, um, a couple of them got their hands on a pair of these last year uh, and worked really well for yep. what they do. You know, they bash them around the park. Um, I will say that with this build and the, the, the shaping, the, the cap construction, all that kind of stuff, if you were to compare it directly to like even a Bent 90, um, or that Oblivion 84 that we're going to talk about in a little bit, you don't get quite the same precision out of this ski. Yeah. So it kind of depends what you're looking for as a park ski or as an all-mountain ski. This one's just going to be a, a little bit looser, yeah. which I think a lot of people really like. Yeah, but nothing wrong with that. Something to consider yeah. for sure. Uh, next up, we'll go a little bit more directional here. We got a K2 Mindbender 85. Yeah, I like these two skis because same price. Yeah, same price, $399, $95, you know, for a new ski. Pretty good. The ski is unchanged uh, from last year, uh, since inception, really. Yep. Um, and I think that the beauty of this is in its simplicity. 100%. Um, it's just amazing what they do. It's hard to think that this is a thousand dollars worse than a Stokely AR right but like you know that's just kind of the nice thing about this K2 is that they're able to mass produce this nice ski that's gonna serve a lot of skiers really well and you don't have to spend fourteen hundred dollars yeah it's fun so I've skied that thing I've had a blast yeah that it's thing. awesome yeah you know simple Aspen wood core uh, they do kind of use this you know mid cap construction uh, you know, especially underfoot, these kind of trapezoidal sidewalls, the slant wall, does give the skier a better leverage over the edges. So there is some thought put into this. Um, you know, it's Aspen Wood Core, 1,700 grams in the 170, so nice mid-range there. And they just put a lot of energy into the camber of the ski here. So that's how they're making it feel like a more energetic, more higher-end ski. I mean, it's really got that camber built in there. Um, you know, all mountain rocker here, great for any type of soft snow you're going to find. Low in the tail, but it's still there. So it's just that great mix of attributes that make this thing easy to ski, yet, you know, a little bit stable. You know, just by keeping it consistent from tip to tail, uh, it's a great ski for a huge range of skiers. Yeah. Um, you know, intermediate, you know, if you're an intermediate kind of like buying your first pair of skis, looking to progress, this is going to take you a few years. Like it's totally. not, it's not a beginner ski by any stretch. It could, I, I guess it could be, I suppose. Yeah. I kind of think of it as like an emerging skier, you yeah. know, someone who's getting into the sport, you know, yeah. whether they could be athletic, they could have a certain skill set, they could be coming back to skiing. Or like a stepping stone off rentals. Yep. Something like that. Yeah, just a huge range. Um, but just a great overall ski from K2. And, you know, with a sticker price of under $400, pretty impressive. Yeah, another $399 ski, so yeah. same, same price as that Ben 85 that yeah. we started with. And, and pre I'd say pretty similar applications, too. Mm -hmm. You know, this ski is just going to give you a little bit more feedback out of the tail, a little bit more precision, yep. stuff like that. Not quite as loose and obviously not a twin tip. So if you want a twin tip, you want to stick in that Bent 85 range. Um, and then the next ski up here is the Head Oblivion 84. Another ski that's back unchanged. This is actually a carryover graphic as well. Uh, the narrower of two skis in the Oblivion line. 
And I think the probably the coolest thing about this ski is that it's, its shape and how it differs from, let's say, most twin tips on the market right yep. now. Um, wood core in this ski, just over 1,800 grams. What length do we have here? I think it's a 77. They do a great job <laughs> of, of marking. Not yeah. putting the length. I don't on see it, it anywhere mean, on mine. Mean 170. <laughs> um, so not tremendously heavy by any means. Uh, but what I think is cool looking at this ski is there's a lot of camber in this ski. Um, and then we don't get any, like, really any early taper at all. Yeah. So if you were to compare it, and that's what we're here for is, is fun comparisons to this Bent 85, this ski has considerably more kind of early taper or a straighter cut through the tip mm -hmm. as well as longer rocker. So this ski is going to be a little looser. That ski is going to be a little bit more precise, give you more feedback, more edge grip, more torsional stiffness. This is a true vertical sidewall through the entire ski. And we go up $50 in price. Yeah. So we're at $449 in this Oblivion 84. And I feel like it's, it's a pretty good representation of what you get when you spend a little bit more money. You get higher quality materials in this ski. Um, as well as a more advanced build. Um, but I really, really like this ski. You know, it's very springy and, and bouncy. Um, I think sort of more of a traditionalist park skier would really, really enjoy this. I actually think there's less all-mountain application for this ski than like the Bent 85 right. shape because you don't have that rocker, the early taper. It's not going to be as wiggly in the bumps or the trees or stuff like that but really really energetic and really responsive and super fun as a park ski yeah i think you said it perfectly with the word traditional like yeah. that's what i like this is the traditional park ski right that one is more modern and modern swerve skier yeah yeah but this has that long effective edge yeah true tip to tail contact it like I carves think. pretty well yeah i like when i first skied this thing i I remember being quite impressed by both its like springiness and bounciness. It's really yeah. easy to like load it up in kind of like a wheelie or an ollie or whatever you want to call it, but also in its its torsional stiffness and its edge grip and how it feels like yeah. through a turn. No, so I suppose it, it could be an all mountain ski if you're more of just a on trail carver. Well, it just reminds me of the older older twin tip 100%. style. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like Head like looked at an old twin tip and was like, yeah. how come no one makes that anymore right. and then made it? Yeah. Um, and I think it's cool because the Oblivion 94 is quite a bit different. Yeah, there's that's more free ridey. Right, there's yeah. more tip and tail rocker. I think like the tips and tails of the Oblivion 84, if we had it up here, you can bend them a little bit easier because yeah. they have that kind of pre-bent rockered shape to it. But really high quality ski, high yep. quality build. Um, I think it's a, it's a fun ski. It works really well for myself. I could totally understand it not working well for right. another type of skier. Uh, this is an interesting one. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, this is the Atomic Maverick 86C. Uh, more directional, similar to the K2. And this thing actually shares an exact footprint with the Maverick 88Ti. So. I don't know how they come up with naming these things, you know, calling yeah. this an 86 and that an 88, but they have the same footprint. Right. Why wouldn't you just call it 88C? I don't know. Why but... wouldn't you just make an 88, <laughs> a Maverick 88Ti and a Maverick 88C and just not confuse us? Right. At any rate, <laughs> you know, that's kind of the impetus for putting this in here is because it's named the 86. Um, but it is 88 underfoot in the 176, I believe. Um, so it does uh, change a little bit based on length, uh, but same footprint, basically same construction as well as the 88 Ti uh, with the poplar wood core. They do substitute the two sheets of metal in the Ti uh, for their carbon backbone. So they are lightening the ski uh, quite a bit. We're at 1600 and just about 1600 grams. Yeah, super um, light. So pretty light, definitely kind of brings the touring capability into the conversation. Um, being able to just have that nice light ski on your feet if you're looking for that 50-50 ski in this range. Uh, this along with like Blaze 86 uh, yep. make great options for that. 
uh, they don't intend it that way, but it ends up being a, a, a pretty decent floater. You know, lightweight, it does have the Horizon Tech in the tips, um, you know, a little bit on the stiff side because of that carbon, um, but still just a great overall performer. Um, so if you're looking for a wider bodied ski in this range that happens to be a little bit lighter, uh, this is a great choice. You yeah. know, carves really well, very snappy, does have that uh, Duracap side or that half sidewall that they use. So as the sidewall goes to cap, that's where the rocker starts. And we see that through all of Maverick skis. So it's a very consistent shaping and footprint principle, uh, just in a lighter weight format and just super energetic and snappy. I think people would be kind of surprised at the, at the pop you get out of this thing. You yeah, know, it's definitely got energy built in. I feel like that's a really like a, 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 a great example of skis that just get overlooked too yep. because there's an 88 Ti and I think most people just go straight to that 88 Ti yep. and that ski just kind of gets lost and there's there's no significant reason why it should get lost other right. than the fact that there's an 88 Ti. I think it's a fantastic ski and I think you could make the argument that it might be more appropriate for a bigger swath of skiers than the 88 Ti. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I mean, the 88 is interesting because it's not like that much heavier than this. No, just a little, little different in yeah. how you kind of load it up and how the ski responds. Yeah. This, this feels really good at slower speeds, yeah. which I think a lot of skiers can benefit from. No, it does have that range. Definitely works pretty well at the shallower edge angles too, where I think that the TI yeah. version uh, does call for a little more yeah. steeper of an approach. Now, would you say it's it's basically the opposite ski to this? Yeah, on this wall, it's pretty darn close to right. oppositional. Yeah, twin tip, precise. Yeah, not much rocker, no taper, directional, looser. Yeah, more versatile, more maneuverable. S super quick. Yeah, yeah, these things are very very agile, um, and we're just at four ninety nine ninety five with this ski, so still under five hundred dollars. Right, which is pretty impressive. Very impressive. So same price in this next ski, which I think is interesting. Um, I feel like both of these skis, you know, they're they're the narrower version of wider skis with more metal. Yeah. But there's quite a bit of technology in these skis still. Yeah. Um, this ski hits that same four ninety nine price point. This is the Stance eighty four from Solomon, um, and. It's a, it would almost be better if Bob got this one because Bob <laughs> spent quite a bit of time skiing this on our trip to Alta. Yeah. And we were kind of like laughing about how probably no one would choose this ski for Alta, but it's such a good example of how good this range is. And right. that you don't necessarily need to go wider even if you want to ski off piste terrain. Right. Like you skied all sorts of stuff on a Stance 84 and it it was a blast. Sure was. And I never <laughs> heard you be like, this isn't fun at all. Can we stop or like, right. can I go switch skis? Right. And we could have switched, like, right. we they could were, have, we they had were there. All sorts of yeah. things at our disposal, but I had a blast. Yeah. So this is the Stance 84. A lot of similarities to the, or the wider Stance skis, the 90, um, even like the 102. Yeah. You know, obviously the shape's quite a bit different, but poplar wood core in this ski, and then we get one sheet of titanal metal. And in these windows, these cutout windows that they do on all the stance skis, they just put carbon in instead of that CFX material. So that's basically how they get the price down on this ski. Yeah. They're just taking out a sheet of metal. Um, that carbon's a, a less expensive application than the CFX, um, and pretty darn light here just under 1500 grams um, and this is the 169 so I'd say that's pretty darn impressive what yep. was maverick 86 uh it was like 1700 so yeah pretty cool that they can and and kind of sister companies right both building great skis um, that are that are pretty darn lightweight too um, i really like the stance 84 it's light it's pretty easy to flick around but there's like there's some strength to it too. Yeah. You know, you can carve on this ski. Um, there's a sheet of metal in here. Like I feel like getting a sheet of metal and some carbon in your skis for $500 is kind of crazy. Right. Um, and I like the shape too. You know, they, all of the stance skis, 
I'd say in all of our comparisons, the stance skis are, are always in discussion among the like high performing skis. Good vibration damping, good responsiveness, good stability, edge grip, all that kind of stuff, but they work a little bit more playfulness and maneuverability into their shape. And I think that's true on the 84 too. So we get that nice early taper in the tip, good amount of tip rocker here. It is a directional ski, but there's a considerable amount of tail rocker back here too. Yeah. And I think like this is probably what helped you out the most in Alta. That flatter tail. Yeah. Yeah. You know, give you some stability, something to push against. Yep. Um, but it's not like you're going to get locked into a turn on them either. No, great shape, you know, spoony enough in the tip to make it a little bit floaty. Yep. I mean, exactly. I had no problem I mean. in that softer snow. Yep. Uh, and then, you know, it wasn't like it was deep when we were there. And I think a lot of these skis fit that category of like, no fresh snow. Like, how often is that? Like, right. way more often than when you're found in this. Right. Um, so having something like this that's super maneuverable in the trees and the bumps, I mean, this is, you know, probably one of the best bump skis up here on the wall. Yeah. Just super easy to get from turn to turn. Great in the woods. Excellent energy. You know, like I would say I found the speed limit on those bottom sections at all to yeah, work. on the, the really steep steep. groomers. Right. I mean, it is really steep. That's where a Stance 90 or a Stance 96 would out yeah. outperform this. Or like hmm, more like skis on yeah. that side of the wall. You know, we start getting into like a different world of torsional stiffness right. and stability over there. Multiple sheets of metal. Right. But for for what this is, for the cost, you know, if you're only missing that top 8% of the right. speed spectrum, then so what? Right. You know, it does everything else so well. Yeah. So that's what really impresses me about the 84. And like, you know, I almost like it more than the 90 for for me and what that's I'm what it doing, seemed like, which right. is just which is hilarious. A little better for shorter, quick yep. turns. Yeah, that's what I like to do. It's just shorter, yep. more consistent turns on the side of the trail. Um, it didn't really hesitate going back and forth, but again, once you started hitting those terminal velocities, that's when you start to notice that this isn't quite yeah this. And it's so light that it, it'll get yeah. bounced around a little bit more, yeah. deflected more easily. The the stance 90 and the 96. They have just such a confident, strong yep. feel. This doesn't feel quite as quiet and damp, especially at those higher speeds. But that's like, do you need that extra stability? I don't know. Right. I would say a lot of people don't. Or how often do you need that it's, extra right. stability? Right. If it's a minuscule percentage of your time, then right. you don't need it. Would you benefit more from a lighter ski that's quicker and more forgiving yeah. than the Right, that minuscule amount of time when you're going like 50 miles an hour. Right. Yeah, I don't think you need. I don't think you do. <laughs> That's up to the consumer, <laughs> right. Bob. <laughs> and a, kind of a pretty similar discussion with this Navigator 85. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been on this ski since inception. You know, I would say much to our dismay, they went from metal to carbon in this ski. I missed the Navigator. 90 really yeah, yeah the 90 was, where um, I was at. but i they had that blue navigator 85 yep. with the hex titanium bridge yeah. yeah i missed the hex titanium bridge yeah i'll, I'll go ahead and say it <laughs> i don't think like with the success and popularity of the enforcers like i think nordica just kind of like identified that as probably an area where they were losing money right because they were sitting on so many of them because Everyone went and bought Enforcer 94s and Enforcer, or I guess it was 93s back then. Right. Uh, and then the 88 came out and then it, like they really didn't need the Navigator 90. But well, yeah, it's it was, still a great ski. Um, and they had the 80, the 85, and the 90. Yeah, it was like a whole line. It was a whole line. So yeah. they just went to 85, replaced the metal with carbon, but kept the same shape. And that's what really people enjoyed about the, or still enjoy about this yeah, ski is the, the shape. shape. was the most important part. Yeah, they're taking this Enforcer-inspired shovel and then mixing it with their Doberman tail. So really just an interesting blend of having that all-mountain flotation, ease of use in the front, and then really strong kick out of the tail. So they do a great job of blending those attributes. Um, if you want to hand me that other one there, yeah, and this um, is the first uh, 
first gi that comes with an included binding. Yeah, I so think this is where the pricing gets a little interesting. Yeah, maybe a little wonky from a numbers perspective, but yep. from four ninety nine ninety five up to five thirty point zero four. Yeah. Right. You know, when you take this TP eleven binding, eleven, yeah, yeah, uh, binding. You know, from a retail perspective, we get that odd number, but. Um, you know, more than fine binding for most skiers out there uh, and just combines really well with this shape, you know, putting this in a really nice category. But, you know, we do still see that camber underfoot here. Not a ton of rocker in the tail, you know, probably pretty similar to that stance in terms of how it's going to behave, um, but definitely has that nice long enforcer looking rocker in the shovel. So, Nice and playful in the front and then very business-like in the rear. Uh, just a nice combination for an all-mountain ski in this range. There's going to be a lot of similar uh, discussions when we get to this ski, Yeah, this M-Pro 85. Yep. It's almost like Dina Star kind of took some inspiration from that shape because there aren't a ton of skis with this shaping concept. Right. With such a contrast between tip rocker and flat tail. Yeah. But a sharp sharp turner as a result yeah you know we definitely see a lot of people completing very clean and round turns on this ski so when you're getting when you're still on that side of the wall price wise you're still getting a good amount of performance out of this yeah um, but yeah i do miss the metal but yeah i do too but I, I it's still like it's a really good ski for learning to carve yep or like taking taking your carving to the next level yep um my dad has this ski and he has progressed, he's 70 years old, but he's progressed so much in the past like four years to the point where he's making like right. true round, clean carbs for probably the first time in his life. And I give a lot of credit to this ski because yeah. the tip shape, like the tip's not fighting you. It's very friendly and compliant, but then the, the rest of the ski has more of a preference to complete that turn and not wash out on you. No, there's something to be said for being able to access right. that side cut, especially in the front. And I've got the master list of skis and prices over here. Um, I just wanted to double check. I know we did the kind of net price with the bindings, but 650 with the binding. With the binding, sure. It's like, yeah. it's a steal. Yeah, that's a great deal. Good you ski. Can't, you can't afford not to buy it. <laughs> Um, so next ski is the Blaze 86 from Vocal. Um, pretty interesting ski. Uh, I think you take, or here I'll hand you one, Bob. They take a lot of influence from the Blaze 94 in this ski. To me, it just feels like a mini Blaze 94 um, and 1,450 grams. So probably the lightest ski up here. Yeah, it's very light. Extremely light. And we'll look at the shape in a little bit too. Um, 549 in this ski. So we're, you know, just making small incremental steps up in price. Um, and I would say in this ski, that price is reflected more in the engineering and how much design went into its shape yeah. rather than high-end materials. Yeah. So lightweight, multi-layer wood core in this ski, fairly simple. And then it's really quite progressive in its shape. So a ton of tip rocker. Anytime we talk about the Blaze skis, it's just like the amount of tip rocker is wild. It's almost not even tip rocker, it's like front rocker. Yeah, it's, like, know, the, it's like the first half of the ski right. is just rocker. Um, and then I don't think it's quite as pronounced in the tail on this ski as you see in skis like the 94, but still a lot of tail rocker back here. The thing that's interesting is there's not much splay. Right. You know, so you still get good consistent edge contact if you have a high edge angle on firm snow. But you combine that rocker with the 3D turn radius of 28 in the tip, 15 underfoot, and 23 in the tail. And this ski is insanely agile. Yeah. It is very, very easy to release the tail edge. It's very, very easy to wiggle and pivot. It's a great like New England tree ski. It's a great mogul ski, especially for somebody who's not like skiing 
like super fast through the moguls like Bob. Yeah, like if you're more deliberate side and side, side yeah. to side and making kind of rounder turns through the moguls, this is a really, really good choice. I will say that there are some fairly significant carving limitations to this ski. In, yeah, in terms of on-piste acumen, yep. maybe a little bit lower on this wall. Yeah, which makes sense. Yep. You know, when you consider that long, that long turn radius in the tip, yep. it just doesn't really want to like pull you into a carving turn. And there's really nothing about the ski that like feels particularly great carving. Right. And that, <laughs> like, I'll admit that when I first ski a ski, and Bob and I skied so many different skis throughout the season, the first thing I do is try and make a carving turn. Yep. Like, it's just... You find the radius. Typically, yep. like, right, there's at least some amount of groomer in front of me, and I'm going to, like, find kind of, like, the balance point of that right. ski for carving. And the first time I skied this, I may have come off of it and said, like, I hate that thing. <laughs> because I tried to carve on it right. and, like, tried to ski it like a Deacon or even, like, a Kanjo here. Right. And it doesn't want to do that. But if you're like Bob was describing himself as a skier, if you like to make a lot of short turns on the side of the trail, if you like to head off piste, but you're not in like deep, soft snow a lot of the time, this is a really, really good ski. Um, in the written part, I wrote that the people's, the ski reps' favoritism has trended narrower in the Blaze series. Yeah, like, all the vocal reps, they like always ski this. But like it started with the now. 106. Yeah, they all They were that. like, this is the best ski ever. Yeah. And then like two years ago, yeah. they went to the 94 and said, this is my, this is yeah. what I grab out of the truck. And then last year, right. that was the one. They so were all like, oh, I'd normally just ski a Blaze 86. Yeah, I think it's hilarious that the industry personnel have, have trended narrower. And I think that that's kind of telling of where we're going as a whole. I think so. They're making great skis that are versatile and pivot and have a touring capability and just kind of do everything really well. But I, I thought that was interesting of note. Yeah, and pretty unique among at least the skis that we've talked about so yeah. far and really like the whole thing. Um, I would say there are certainly some similarities to this ski. Sure. You know, they're both focused on more maneuverability and, and off-piece yeah. scenarios and stuff like that. But there are also some fairly significant differences between those skis. Yeah, totally. The the Maverick feels a lot more responsive and, and rounder in its turn shapes, where this is just very pivoty, smeary, yeah. wiggly. Like Z-shaped turns yeah. versus S. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's a great way to think about it. That's good, yeah. Z-shaped turns <laughs> instead of S-shaped turns. That's a good segue to our next S-shaped turn This ski. is an S-shaped turn. This is an S. Sure. And this is more like... A very dramatic S, you know, like an up the hill sure. S. Yeah. Um, this is a new Atomic Redster Q7. Like an eight? Can you get an eight? I don't know. <laughs> That's a challenge. <laughs> a good challenge for next Maybe year. Maybe at least just a full circle carve. Um, but kind of, you know, a new kind of concept from Atomic here. They're delving into this mid 80s front side. I would say this is our most front side. So, oriented so ski far, so absolutely. far. Yep. Um, you know, they're pairing that 84 millimeter waist with a short turn radius, and they're putting a lot of their Redster technology into it. So they're really mixing a bunch of things that already exist into a new thing for them. Um, yeah. And so, did you mention that it's the same shape as the 9.8? Not yet. Okay. But I will. Sorry to get ahead of you. This ski is the same shape as the Redster 9 point Q9.8. <laughs> so same footprint, you know, similar to what we see with Atomic with the Mavericks. Yep. So, you know, twin footprint, uh, very similar construction as well. Really all they're substituting is uh, in the ServoTech area. So the RevoShock. The RevoShock. Thank you. It's okay. Um, I'm still getting those mixed up. They still make both of them. So it's... I, right. I don't, I don't fault you. <laughs> Basically, they got these floating plates in here. Uh, these are carbon. The ones in the 9.8 are steel. So you're getting a little heftier of a damping agent with the 9.8. Uh, but the 7 is going to be more reactive. It's pretty stiff. Um, and like I said, really just a short turn radius in this ski here. 14.4 uh, uh, in this 173. It's such a big, wide shovel, too. Huge it shovel. It just loves just ripping yeah. you into a turn. 
anytime that we're getting into like this wider bodied format and keep the short turn radius intact, it's going to have a pretty massive shovel. Um, we see that with like the line blade and yeah. Sakana and stuff like that. These bigger skis with shorter turn radius. Right, those kind of that's a bit of an exaggeration with yep. those skis, but same concept. Um, but yeah, great system ski overall. Uh, we are getting up in price a little bit, five eighty four ninety five. Right, but uh, as a on the net, net ski only yep. price. Yep. There's a lot of technology in that ski for under six hundred dollars. Uh, we do get metal underfoot still, and this is a fully cambered ski, um, and uh, quite a bit of camber in there as well. Just a lot of bounce in there. Yep. So you are getting that true tip to tail edge contact. You know the binding does kind of weigh it down a little bit, but there's still just that nice preload in there that's going to get get you from one turn to the next. Um, because of its shape and that turn radius, it doesn't really love to go super fast. Um, we see that with head V10 as well. No, it prefers to come across the ball. Yeah, that you, it's really meant to make those big swooping carving turns um, as opposed to that more directional straighter line format like we'll see kind of in our next ski with that Dina Star. Um, so definitely kind of that carving skier ski that's looking to make linked carving turns. Uh, but in that realm, this thing is stiff, responsive, athletic, um, and a whole lot of fun. You know, it's just great to get on something like this that has kind of that one dimensional feeling to it. But what it does, it does so well, um, you know, as opposed to something like Blaze or Stance that has kind of more of that universal appeal. Yeah, this is more of a specific on-trail tool. Um, and I'd say a, a reasonable upgrade in binding from the last yeah. system ski that we looked at, which does bring the overall price of these skis to $799.95. So, you know, we were saying under $600 for the ski alone, yep. and then you're tacking on a considerable amount of price because you get a high quality binding. Right. And I think like, as we go through, you'll see more and more and more of that and like there's a ton of high quality bindings over there right. so maybe like a little bit of sticker shock going from this ski to this ski for overall price it's just important to consider that you are getting a, a pretty significant step up in binding yep. feel and performance and all that kind of stuff yeah but either q7 or q98 you know both of those having that great shape you know, I would say more similar to what we've been seeing out of something like Titan in terms of intent and application, that wider bodied front side ski. Yep. Um, next ski is the M Pro 85 from Dina Star. Uh, this may look like it comes with a binding. It does not. Yep. This is a demo ski. We have not received our uh, retail M Pro 85s just yet. So thank you to the rep for dropping this pair off for this video purpose. Um, I got to ski this quite a bit this past season. Yeah, you were a big fan. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, this ski is awesome. Um, it basically takes like the whole concept of the M-Pro 90 and the 99, drops the waist width obviously to 85, and we drop the Titanal rocket frame. Uh, we still have the rocket frame concept, but it's basically just fiberglass. Right. Um, so we'll kind of look at that rocket frame and how it corresponds to the ski's shape in just a second. This one is not worth putting on the scale with this demo binding on it. Um, but ski alone, we're up to $599.95. And I think there's a lot to like about this ski at $600. Yeah. It's just, it's very fun. I think it's a big upgrade from what it's coming off of too, that Legend That 84. Legend 84? Yeah. Yeah. A lot stronger, yeah. I thought. Um, but still versatile too. So we see the versatility in these skis comes from the tip shape. So we get a lot of tip rocker up here, kind of that progressive splay um, or progressive rise, and then quite a bit of early taper too. Yeah. So we've talked about it with the 90 and the 99 a lot. We've often used the phrase that they're, they're real skiers, skis, because with this tip shape, you are in 100% control of where the ski goes. Right. It does not ever feel like it's hooking up and taking you into a turn that you might not want to make or making your turn shorter than you want it to be or anything like that, you really dictate where the ski goes and what it does. Yeah. Now, 
it's quite a bit different in the tail. We have a flatter tail, and with that rocket frame, the extra material, in this case fiberglass, there's a lot more of it back here in the tail. So you get a pretty darn strong finish to a turn on this ski. Um, and I just had a blast skiing it. So this is the 176. We have a, a 16 meter turn radius. It may have felt shorter than that to me, or maybe it's just that it's so easy to access that, that yeah. side cut up the ski. I think accessibility is the key yeah. with, with the 85. I just found it yeah. extremely rewarding. It makes beautiful turns on groomers. Um, and you can take it off a groomer too and you're not gonna feel completely lost. Right. I do think it's like the type of thing where you should probably be like at least a, a more advanced intermediate skier or a more accomplished intermediate skier with your technique if you're choosing this ski as an all-mountain ski because the tail is stiffer and flatter and requires a little bit of unweighting yeah. and kind of it's not just going to smear and slip into a into a smear a, a pivot like a blaze would or even like a, a maverick would right i think this ski you have to be a little bit more active a little bit more engaged and kind of pick up the back end of your ski to get it to move around but it's super super fun i yeah. just yeah i think i skied an entire day on these Again. And why wouldn't you? You know, well, it's, like, it's it's a similar discussion to the stance, I think, where, right. you know, we're in this 85 millimeter zone and, yeah, it doesn't have metal all the way through. And right. it doesn't have, you know, that high-end build to it, but it has... Yeah, there's still some strength to it. It has everything it needs to take a skier like you or I all day having fun. Yeah. And, like... For me, that's kind of like the beginning and end of the conversation. Like, right. can a ski do that? Then great. Yeah. You know, like, sh you just have to look for shape, price, other than that. Yep. But really cool stuff. Good to see that they kind of followed in that, you know, that other M-Pro footstep and came up with this thing. I like the idea that, like, if you choose this ski instead of the M-Pro 90, it leaves you extra room in your budget for pivots. Because <laughs> this ski with a pivot on it would be sweet. Yep. And like, in in every sense of the word, a very high-end, high-performing ski. Yep. If you put a binding like that on it, or really any binding, but I think if you, you know, slap a pivot on here and you got a $1,000 ski pretty much, ski and binding. Nothing wrong with that either. And that would be like <laughs> a really, really fun, fun tool in my opinion. Yep. Uh, next up here, we got Armada Declivity 88C, uh, another, I would say, unsung hero on this wall, getting buried by the uh, TI versions, the 82, 92, 102, now 108. Yep. Um, basically, they're using a Karuba wood core in here with carbon stringers instead of metal like the uh, TI versions do, and that just makes it a little bit snappier, more energetic, more my style, I would say. Um, we are bumping up in price. You know, this is, I would say, getting into that, you know, premium ski pricing. I think so. Um, $649. And the next four skis, I think, are all in the just right around $650 range. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of that just has to do with the technology and the construction that goes into these things. Um, and great for Armada for kind of keeping this, you know, all mountain flare going. Very more typically known for freestyle free ride skis, but uh, they make great all mountain and frontside skis too don't they they really do i mean they're just awesome awesome skis yeah a i lot own of that people... declivity 92 and i love it yeah and this would be and you i know, think you would own this and love it i i would and like every time i've gotten on this and we talk with the rep about it like how much fun is this thing yeah like it's just a bouncy playful ski that carves really well on trail uh, but has that light weight that's able to take it off trail and just make it super maneuverable. Um, I kind of wish we had a Mindbender 90C up here just to talk about next to this ski because yeah. they're both really good and they both get overlooked quite a bit. Uh, 1,700 grams in the 176, so pretty darn light. You yeah, know, not definitely a heavy ski. Yeah, makes good use of the carbon stringers in here uh, to make it nice and stiff. And then we get some nice long effective edge too. Um, great camber underfoot. 
nice and poppy built in and not a ton of rocker. I think that this spoonier tip shape really helps with the flotation. You know, this is one of the wider skis on the wall. So pretty good in soft snow uh, in this range. Uh, that lightweight combined with this tip shape, I think is really effective uh, in powder soft snow. Um, you know, not a ton of rocker. We definitely see more of that camber underfoot. And then I would say with appropriate and ski appropriate rocker in the tail, you know, just enough to keep you a little bit drifty, but not too much that this thing's going to wash out. So having this grippy mentality in this ski, I think goes a long way in creating that overall character, but yeah, you know, kind of a shame that this thing gets buried. Uh, new graphic for this year. Hopefully that'll make it pop off the wall, get, get a little bit more interest, but Great overall ski from Armada, you know, really complements those TI versions uh, quite well. Uh, but definitely like my, my style ski in terms of making shorter, quicker turns on the side of the trail. Love right. this thing. And a good way to kind of determine what declivity is right for you. Right. If you're more into like higher speed carbs, probably better to stick with the TIs. Yeah. If you're more into short turns on the side of the trail and moguls and trees and stuff like that, there's a lot to like about this yeah. 88C. Yeah, I just don't feel like I require that much dampness in my ski, that I prefer the energy and the kick out of the turn. Yeah, and there's a diff there's a noticeable difference. Yep. Like that 92 Ti just feels so damp and quiet and like yep. kind of like glued to the snow, where this, yeah, a lot quicker, bouncier, yep. stuff like that. Um, next ski we have here is the Vocal Kanjo 84. Um, I've always really liked this ski and it, it just, it fits a really nice role or, or fills a nice role in vocals line. And I, maybe this is a good time to point out that we have four vocal skis up here Yep. and they're all quite different. I mean, I guess the two Deacons over there are more similar than different, but if you were to go Blaze to Kanjo to Deacon, there's a, a, a really simple progression there of loose and maneuverable off-piece, yep. very, very strong carving ski, and then this is basically right in the middle. Right. Um, so there's a lot of really good applications for this ski. A lot of skiers would really, really enjoy this. I do think there's somewhat of like, maybe like a weight limit. Like I think this is the type of ski where I probably have a different different reaction to it and different experience on it than you do. Yeah, it might be a little, there might not be enough mass in this thing it's overall. It's a pretty lightweight ski. Um, we get that multi-layer wood core in this ski. We get a Titanal binding platform underfoot. So another like fun example of like a bunch of like different vocal technologies oh, yeah. just kind of like mashed yep, into one got them ski. All. Um, and then, then in this ski we get glass frame. So kind of a similar concept to Back here with Dina Star, yep. where the 90 version of this ski has that Titanal rocket frame. The Kendo version of this ski, if you want to call it that, has Titanal frame, right. where this is just fiberglass. That allows them to keep the weight down, so under 1,600 grams in this ski. Yeah, crazy light. Super, super light. Yep. Um, but still, like, fairly stiff. Um, you know, I think probably that's one of the differences that we might feel between you and I but I still find this ski pretty darn strong and fairly responsive. Yeah. And every time I ski it, I have a lot of fun on it. It's super, super quick. You can make like short turns on the side of the trail like Bob likes to do, but then you can open it up into bigger sweeping carves. There's, it's an interesting ski because it's so easy to load up with energy that sometimes it can like kick you a little bit wrong. And I think that's, that's something that like not everyone's going to experience. It depends how fast you ski and how big you are. If you're like a hard charging ski and you're shopping in the vocal line, you're probably over there in the Deacon world, or maybe you're just going straight to a Kendo 88. Right. And like, that's great. That's a great choice. If you're, if you don't like charge all the time or you're not like a super, super strong skier, I think that's where this ski comes into play because it can be just so rewarding on more moderate pitches, you know, flatter terrain, and also at slower speeds. It's just, it's a very, very fun ski. 
Um, and I think, you know, I, I can pretty much guarantee that more people choose kendos, but this is one of those interesting conversations where it's like, would, would those skiers or how many kendo skiers would be better off choosing a Kanjo 84? Right. I don't know. Like 40%? 30%? Got to be at least 30%. It's interesting, like, watching accomplished skiers, you know, like, following you with a camera on this, seeing the performance that this can yeah. attain. Right. And being like, well, like, there aren't too many people that are going to exceed that. So why do you need the kendo right. when this exists? And for those skiers that do exceed that, that's when the kendo comes right. into play, and it's really valuable ski, and that's, it provides exactly what you're looking for. But yeah. I think the Kanjo 84 is a great ski. Um, you know, I could see, uh, going back to my dad skiing that Navigator 85, I could see, like, this being the, a good next ski for him. So it's a little step up in performance, but not, like, yeah. too demanding. I feel like this is, like, the Solomon QST 92 of this wall, where if you're looking for a ski in this range and you don't know what to get, this is a, really a strong option. Yep. Like, if after all this, you're like, I just don't know. And it's kind of interesting that it's, like, in the middle of the wall here. Yeah. Like, we went by price here, but it kind of feels like even if we had gone by, like, looseness to right. tightness or whatever you want to call it, it still would have been in the middle. Yeah. Like, this is pretty much, it's always going to be in the middle. No I, matter how you organize the skis, yeah. this one's right in the middle, which is a good represent, representation of how good it is as an all-mountain ski. And that's what these things are. They're all-mountain skis. Right. Um, and still 649 here. So same price as that Declivity 88C, yeah. um, but quite a bit different, wouldn't you say? I would, you know, and definitely insofar as that I would choose that 88C for myself, but probably not that. Just yeah, and I, I think if I had to, if you, like, if you sat me down and you were like, Jeff, you can have one ski, it's either going to be a Declivity 88C or a Kanjo 84, yeah. I, I would take that Kanjo. All right. Because it just, I think it, it like works really well for a smaller skier like right. myself. And it, it, the way it snaps out of a carve is really rewarding. And I would just do that on it. Yeah. Uh, head V shape V10, EV10. New one this year. This so. one's interesting too because like. We're going to have to get the sheet out for this I one. I get most excited <laughs> about this ski because of the binding. Yeah. Um, their new protector binding and yeah we'll just do it right off the bat so then you you don't have to get distracted this is a thousand dollar ski when you include the binding yep 999 99 sorry <laughs> <laughs> but you know you take that binding out which is valued at three hundred and fifty dollars and then we're, we're back in that six hundred and fifty dollar range right so Really and cool that you get a lot of binding performance or a lot of binding technology, and it's that's important to consider. And I could see somebody that like watched this video and then went and shopped and was like, "Well, that's you said this ski was like affordable, and now right. it's a thousand dollars." Right. This binding is the reason why. Yeah, the and j we can probably get more in depth on this later, but basically a lateral heel heel release. Yeah. On the binding, so it reduces knee injuries, and that's the whole point of that protector binding. And that's kind of a thing with Tyrolia moving forward. So it's cool to see them implement it on a system ski as well. So yep. that you're kind of getting that value and safety built in. Um, but from the ski's perspective, we are dealing with their Karuba wood core. Uh, we have carbon and graphene. It's basically a head core, uh, but in a more front side shape. So it has all of those attributes. It also has their EMC, their energy management circuit. So the idea is that it just filters out unwanted vibrations. Um, it has that in the head Titan as well. Um, you know, whether it works as advertised, I don't know, but they are smooth and stable. So I'm going to give it to them there. They've got engineers. They have engineers. I'm sure there's a reason for it. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting, you know, it's technology. So that's something good that's put in here. Um, and then like the Atomic, that Q7, we're seeing a short turn radius. So this wider bodied ski, 85 underfoot, and we are getting a 13.6 meter turn radius in the 170. Talk so about an aggressive S. Definitely getting into that aggressive S standpoint. And then like those core skis, we're seeing a pretty stiff flex. So it's, you're gonna wanna get this thing up on edge and it's gonna wanna take you across the hill. Uh, you know, diametrically opposed from that Dina Star, 
uh, where you have to put your own input in. The reactivity of the carbon in the ski combined with that shape is going to make this thing just go boop and you're up on a high edge angle. And that's the whole point of these shape series skis, um, you know, especially in this V10 with the wider body, is that each and every movement you put into it is going right to the edge and this thing's coming across the hill. Uh, also similar, similar to that Q7, uh, not the best at speed. So you're going to want to be a more moderate speed skier focusing on those short, shorter linked carved turns. Um, but there are a lot of those skiers out there yeah. that are looking for that confidence and control in the carved turn. Uh, and this has that nice blend of carbon, uh, lightweight wood core, and then that safety in the binding to really help get you there. So pretty cool new ski from Head. Um, you know, and that was my big takeaway from uh, the outgoing V10 was, wow, this thing's great. It loves to make short turns, but like you cannot go over 25, 30 miles an hour on the thing. Right. Or else the tip shape is just, it's just too wide. If you're riding it flat, like a slalom ski, it's just going to end up doing that. So it really prefers to be up on edge. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you've skied a, a Titan before and you were like, that was fun, but yeah. like that was kind of a lot of work and like I don't really want to ski that fast and that hard all the time. Yeah. Then this would be a good choice. Yeah, definitely. I like to think of it as like a, a combination between a core and a super shaped Titan. Yeah. No, that's pretty darn accurate um, and just a cool ski for making those round, round shaped carved turns. So next ski up here and starting the right side of the wall here is the Experience 86 Basalt. Um, this ski shares the same shape with that Experience 86 Ti, but in this ski we get a lighter wood core, so we get a Polonia wood core, um, and we also get Basalt rather than Titanol in that ski. Yep. So quite a bit different in its construction, and I would say there's a, there's a pretty big difference between their performance, too. Um, this does get that SPX-12 binding, so pretty solid binding on here. $250 value yep. in the binding, so that's putting the whole package up to $900. We'll say the ski itself is $650, but this ski comes specifically with bindings where that 86 Ti you can just buy it flat and put whatever you want on there. And it also has that connect option too. Yep. So that's this, true. Yep. You don't have to buy it flat. Correct. Um, and if you want to hand me that other one over there, um, I think the most interesting thing about these skis, and they've been out for a while now, so this isn't like a new conversation, but is this tip shape or drive tip solution as Rosignol calls it. Um, we get a good amount of tip rocker up here but we also get very extended side cut right. profile, which is kind of like a combination of every version of experience skis that we've had. At first they were mostly camber with very extended side cut. Then they went to that kind of early tapered and rockered shape and tried to get more all mountain versatility in them. Yep. And then they went to this shape, which feels like a blend of the two. Flatter tail than tip, so I think that's kind of important in its feel and in overall performance. And then again, just extended side cut here in the tip or in the tail. Um, so this ski, very similar to kind of how we were talking about Kanjo, um, some of the other skis like M Pro 85 that have stiffer, heavier versions yeah. of that ski it's a pretty similar conversation here where if you are a more moderately aggressive skier you don't ski crazy fast and you don't need like edge grip or edge hold on really steep terrain this might actually be a better choice for you than that experience 86 ti because it's easier to get this ski to bend and load up yeah. energy on it and that was something that I found in all my testing on this ski is it is more rewarding and more fun to ski um, on trails that I would normally consider kind of boring. Right. And it, I think yeah. like that's a really cool aspect about a ski is if it can make the boring trails fun. Right. So 
really fun. It hooks up and goes into a car very intuitively. You know, they did a great job with this tip shape design, like the, having that rocker, but the extended side cut, it's like, you know, we don't have an enforcer up here, but it like, it's kind of similar to the enforcer yeah. conversation. And like the further you tip it on edge, the more it's going to hook up and go. It's almost more exaggerated in this ski because it, it is just completely extended side cut through the ski. Um, but they don't take away its versatility completely. I would say the previous experience shapes were a little more agile in the trees and stuff like that. But this ski doesn't feel locked into a turn either. Um, I right. do think it's probably best for somebody who leans more towards carving than like moguls for their ski choice. But it's not like terribly stiff and demanding either. Right. So really good ski. Um, and I think it's very fair to say that that ski gets overlooked just because the Experience 86 Ti exists. Yeah, and I think that either way you go, the shape is a very effective blur yeah. of front side and all mount. Exactly. And that's where the success of the experience shaping comes into play. Yep. And if you're looking for something lighter, more maneuverable, basalt's the way to go. Right. And if you're high speed and more aggressive, then that TI is an absolute rocket ship and a ton of fun. Yeah. Um, but not a huge limitation on performance on this either. So it's, you know, just has that, that well-rounded nature to it that make it a great competitor in this series. Yeah, it's really just high speeds. Yeah. Like, it's like that 40, 40 plus mile an hour yep. zone where that the Experience 86 Ti is going to feel just a little smoother and yep. more confidence inspiring. And that ski starts to kind of kind of dance around on you a little more than you might want. But right. it's kind of like the opposite conversation at like 30 miles an hour. Like this ski is more rewarding at that slower speed, at least yep. in my opinion. And I think that that's a good segue into the Elan Wingman 86 CTI, which love that thing. I find to be one of the faster skis up here on the wall that was my first uh initial experience a few years ago anyway getting on this thing was man this thing wants to go it's super fun and it's so fun um so a lot of different kind of options in the wingman series this is it's fair to say this is the you know flagship model of the wingman line uh, the widest, it has the carbon tube light wood core, similar to what we talked about with the ripstick. So there are carbon rods in the side of this ski. And then we get the metal as well, um, in addition to their amphibio rocker and construction technology. So right, left specific ski uh, on the inside edges. So we have a bump out, maybe hard to see on the camera here, but it basically, there's more material, more mass over the inside of the edge, uh, inside half of the ski, putting more emphasis on that downhill foot. Um, so you're getting better grip, better performance and stability uh, as a result. Um, and then they also include that uh, rocker in there as well. So just a little bit of that asymmetrical rocker in here makes this thing pretty darn easy to get on edge but very low profile in the tip. And that's kind of where I found a lot of the speed came from. Um, I want to get this back on the scale because it's pretty, pretty light. light. 172 here, we're at just under 1,700 grams. So for a ski with metal in it, that's pretty impressive. Uh, also how it differentiates itself from like the rest of the wall. Yeah. Because we've kind of like, it feels like we've made a shift from Experience 86 Basalt to that ski, yeah. where like pretty much everything else that we're gonna talk about is the top of the line ski right. in the catalog. And that's true about this ski, um, but it's, it's lighter than, I'm pretty sure everything else that we're gonna look at. Yeah, you're probably right. And it's also kind of interesting that like at this point, now that we're in that top of the catalog um, range, yeah. That's where like value kind of starts to be an interesting conversation. Like that's a very, very high performing ski um, and it's a little bit less expensive than some things that we're gonna look at as we go through it. Yeah. So kind of, that's why I think it's fun to group this, 
group this range by price yeah because we really start to highlight value and that ski what jumps up to 700 yeah 699.95 699.95 and just incredibly fast pretty stiff you know definitely has that nice flex to it um shape wise yeah. kind of similar to this evolve 84 very similar just um, different construction concepts totally different construction concepts but really can i mean if we put these back to back it's like <laughs> Kind of a very similar type of splay in the tips as well as the tail. We should so ski them together. Just right foot, left foot. Yeah, you know, do it. Very, very similar squared off tail shape. Um, you know, they're going for that same thing, just using slightly different construction practices. And even amongst this wall, uh, these skis have very different construction techniques than other traditional skis. Um, but just a sharp, sharp turning ski, loves to go fast. Uh, I think it's also safe to say that we're also losing some versatility as we get to this side. I think so too, with, um, with like a couple exceptions. A couple but exceptions. But yeah, but it starts to feel more like carving skis. Yeah, these are wide, wide carving skis. They, they get their versatility from their width rather than uh, their shaping principles or the fact that they're right. derivative off of more free ride skis. These are, and this wingman specifically as the widest of the wingman series uh, has that front side mentality to it. Um, and again, just gets its any versatility that it has from the 86 millimeter waist. But, you know, not a pleasure to ski in the woods or the moguls. You know, it's definitely happier on firm and groomed snow. Yep. Um, very, very rewarding too. Yeah. Yeah. You get a ton of energy. Yeah. You know, same as what we were saying about rip sticks. You know, just an amazing amount of snap uh, due to that carbon, um, but just a great overall choice, especially if you're spending most or all of your time on groom surfaces. And very, very intuitive. Yep. It's like the type of ski that, with how easy it is to ski and kind of the shorter turn radius i can't remember if you mentioned turn radius I did not 15.6 turn radius in that ski yep. so you know it doesn't take much to get it to come across the fall line and it, it, it to me it's one of those skis that just like makes you feel like a better skier yep like you you literally click in and go for your first run and you're like oh i'm like really good at this yeah <laughs> and then there's other skis where you know they're a little bit more demanding and yep. ask more of you um, so yeah if you don't need like full race build and you want a really, really rewarding carving ski and something that I think holds a lot of value, I think that Wingman 86 is, is a great, great ski. And that's a good kind of transition to this. Well, which... it's interesting that you, like the first thing that I thought when you said that's to me the fastest ski, yep. is I was like, is it the quickest? I don't know. Because if you like stood me at the top of Nosedive or Hayride at Stowe, which are both kind of steeper, groomed trails and said i want you to go as fast as you can and you let me choose from all the skis up here i would choose this okay so are you turning or not turning no i'm going as fast as okay. i can yeah the fastest ski the highest speed that i can get to i still think i've gone the fastest on that well that's fine <laughs> i would choose this one um, this is the Fisher RC1 86 GT. A lot going on there in the name. Um, still in the 699.95 price point. Um, and to me, it's like very, very different than that Wingman that we just looked at. Yeah, very much so. Like same width. They yep. kind of like for both companies, they sit in the same spot in the catalog but they feel very, very different, and yeah. it's almost like opposite concepts. So this ski is basically built like a race ski. Dense wood core and two, like, thick yeah, sheets of metal. Yeah, I think it's like 0.8 millimeter. 0. 0.7 yeah. or 0. 0.8, yeah. yeah. It's like the, it's literally the same thickness metal that you would get in a race ski, which gives it, like, God, it's strong. Yeah, they're strong skis. It's burly. Yeah. And every time I ski this thing, I'm reminded just how strong it is. And then it's also interesting that you kind of like, we're saying that we're moving into more carving skis. And I think that's true, but this feels like sort of one of the exceptions. Yep. 
because Fisher does build some versatility into this ski and that versatility is kind of coming from the shape. So we get more tip rocker than you're going to see in most kind of carving focused skis. We also get a little bit of a straighter cut through the tip um, and those same concepts kind of apply to the tail. You know, we get a little, little bit of tail rocker back here, but I think that taper is important to point out. Like there are going to be some more squared off, flatter tails over there. Yeah, like that super shape. Yeah, like, like if they put that build with this shape, right? Like you'd, you'd be in trouble. You'd break your leg. Yeah. Maybe. I would break my leg. Um, so this ski is very, very strong, very stable at speed, has awesome, awesome vibration damping. But I've always found that you can kind of, you can release the tail edge and get it to kick out and make kind of like a slashy smeared turn more easily than like than that head, yeah. on that Titan. Yeah. So really good ski for a super aggressive, very, very high speed skier. Somebody who has like very specific high demands for their skis. You know, like you know that you ski fast, you ski aggressively, you ski steep terrain and you need something that's going to going to satisfy your needs right. and kind of live up to your expectations. This is a, a really, really good ski. Um, and just to take a quick look at the shape, 17 meter turn radius in this 175. So not going to come across the ball line quite as easily as something like a wingman. Right. I think this ski requires more skier input. It's less intuitive and it's really, really good for that, that super aggressive, strong skier. Like maybe you've got a race background and you want a ski that you can drive like a race ski but will allow you to kind of explore the mountain too. I ski bum raced on this this year. Yeah, you probably did great. Yeah, I don't think it was my best performance, but I had a blast on the skis. You know, definitely had that. I skied on a lot of like 86, 88, so like it definitely had more of that front side, that race mentality to it for sure. Yep versus a, a Mindbender 89 Ti. Yeah, it's interesting because it doesn't feel like a race ski. Right. Outside of its construction, like that that part feels like a race ski. The rest of it feels like an all-mountain ski. Yeah. Just a very strong all-mountain ski. It almost would like, it's kind of, I don't know, sort of like unfortunate that it doesn't exactly fall into like a Brahma 88 discussion. Yeah. Because I think that's, a better comparison like this ski to Brahma 88 to Enforcer 88 to Kendo 88. Right. I think that's this ski lives in that world a little bit more than it lives in this world, which might not make sense, but it does <laughs> in my head. I mean, it's they're fun, they're fast, like exactly. you said, right? It's just a they're very, very stable, powerful, all mountain skis. It's like the first one on this list that you don't feel anything under your feet. Like no. it is complete stability. Yep. Unflinching. And this thing kind of does the same thing in a slightly different way. This is the head of all, uh, sorry, Liberty Evolve 84. Um, you same know, price. Same price. So yep, right yep. under 700. Uh, they do it in a different way. They're using more of bamboo and vertical metal as opposed to horizontal, uh, horizontally laminated metal sheets. Um, so bamboo and poplar in the wood core. And then we get three vertical metal strips that run through the center of the ski. Really does a nice job of stiffening it, but more so preventing the counter flex of the ski. So that's where the stability and, the, and kind of the smoothness is coming from, a combination of that bamboo and that vertical metal. Uh, 1,615 grams. This is the 172. Uh, just a great turning ski. We're kind of taking that free ride you know, construction, that free ride company, similar to what we saw from Armada. And this is kind of their spin on a front side ski. So 84 underfoot, this narrow ski that Liberty makes uh, and one of the cleanest turning and kind of easiest to get on. Um, really an awesome choice for skiers that are looking for a ski in this category that want to ski all mountain. I think it's really got a good versatile, versatile nature to it. Really similar to what we see in stance, um, just has a different 
different feel, a different sound. De to it. Definitely. Um, yeah. And that kind of niche style of construction it accounts for that price difference. Um, but yeah, definitely kind of a similar overall style of ski where you're looking to make carved turns, but you also don't want to limit it to front side and groomers. But really cool choice, super long effective edge, um, good camber underfoot. You know, we're not, we're seeing that same low profile style that we saw with Wingman, you know, not a ton of splay up here. And then just long effective edge all the way through a reasonably flat tail. So pretty squared off, uh, nice kick out at the end. Really great choice for skiers that like to link those carved turns. Um, I like it in the bumps. You know, I kind of like all these evolved skis in the moguls. Um, as the narrowest one, I would say that this is my favorite because it's just a little quicker. A little quicker. Do you think it's a little more mogul compliant than Wingman? Yep. You know, they share similar shapes like yeah. you were showing, but yeah, I do think there's something about this ski. Yep. I always like go back to the fact that Liberty's based in Colorado. Right. And I feel like they try and like build that like Colorado versatility or capabilities into all their skis. And like some of the V, what was the narrowest V series? 72. It was 72, yeah. And like that, they were kind of like losing it there. And I'm kind of glad that they just did away with those skis and kept like, this feels like a Liberty. Right. Even though it's 80, like really narrow compared to most of Liberty's skis and it, it is more carving focused, there's still that like, there's still like a weird, weird amount of fun factor to <laughs> yeah. it. When like, I don't really know exactly where it's coming from, but it's, it's coming from it's the there. bamboo, you yeah. know, and I think that that's what separates it is the, just these different woods give these skis different feels, you know, whereas you're looking at a Polonia, which is pretty light and snappy, that bamboo is just a little bit more quiet and supple. So they're pairing that with that vertical metal. So you're getting that silence of the bamboo, but the energy of that vertical metal. So they're really just a unique construction in this thing that sets it apart from really anything else up here and just gives it a different personality. So yeah. if you're looking for that, you know, that Liberty, that Colorado infused personality, like this is an awesome choice, just a different feel than, than anything else. Yeah. Some Kanjo similarities too, I feel yeah. like, and, and just their versatility, different feel, yeah. a very different sound, but yeah, for sure. similar application. Um, and then this is the Deacon 84 from Vocal. So I don't remember where you brought this up, Bob. I think with the Wingman, um, but this is like the widest Deacon. Right. And the Deacon skis start at 72. Right. So we're really in a, a carving focused category for this ski, at least from Vocal's perspective. And I think that's the best way to think about this ski yeah. is it is a wide carving ski. So from Vocal, we've gone from like tree ski, like mogul and tree ski to versatile, right, like to even, even mix yep. of performance characteristics. And now this Deacon 84 kind of leans more towards the carving side and a very, very rewarding ski. And another ski that, you know, Vocal's pretty cool in their engineering. They use a lot of different stuff in these skis. So we get 3D glass. I think it's still fair to say that there's 3D ridge in this ski yeah, too. Yeah, there sure is. They don't like put it on the tail here, but like that's 3D ridge and they've called it, they've, they've pointed it out in other skis. Yep. And then we get tightenal frame too. So there's just a lot going on here. And we also get that 3D radius in this ski. So 24 meters in the tip, 21 meters in the tail, and then it shortens to 15 underfoot. And I think what's interesting is as you get to this Deacon, that 3D radius, you feel it more in its carving than you do in how it's letting you release the yeah. tips and tails and kind of get the ski to pivot. So what I really like about this Deacon is how easily you can manipulate the radius of your carve. And I think like a lot of people that like to carve, that that's what you do when you go skiing, or at least when you're grabbing your mid 80 underfoot skis out of your garage, is you're thinking about carving. So it just is very rewarding to me and how it, like right. if you kind of gas pedal it right here, you can really shorten that, that turn up and make it like super snappy and responsive. Or if you just kind of let it run, you can make like a 23 meter radius turn on this ski, which yep. is a really big turn, like a true 
big giant slalom turn. Um, and it, it's just, it's really cool how vocal kind of builds both abilities into the ski. Um, and ski alone here, the way that we kind of, the way that we figured it out is it's $730. It's a thousand dollar package with essentially a griffin. Right. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're up in the thousand dollar range here. The only other ski that hit a thousand with, with bindings was, was this head. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with binding, it, it's, you're opening up your wallet a little bit for this one, but I think there's the necessary engineering and, and performance in this ski to warrant that price. Yeah, and I'll take your 3D radius a step further and say that the most rewarding thing for me there is being able to alter the turn shape mid-turn. Yeah. So right. like, you don't have to predetermine, I'm gonna make a 26 meter radius here. It's your starting long, and then with your pressure, you can really change the shape mid-carve yep. without letting go of that pure edge control. And I think that that's like, a, and, and like you said, it's more exaggerated in these carving skis than it is in Kanjo or Kendo or something like that, where you're, you're getting the precision to back up the technology in something right. like this. And I think that that's really important to note from you know, an advanced and expert skier's standpoint um, you know, great technical ability skiers will just love this thing. Yeah, and like I really like the 3D radius in this ski and this ski and yeah. like everywhere that Vocal uses it, I just think it, it provides a different thing. Yeah. It gives the ski a different characteristic in this than it does in like a Blaze 106. Right. Like it's not, like the Blaze 106, you're not out there like manipulating different radius carves. Or it's easier to do in powder, right. you know, and you don't notice it as much. But sure. if you're on trail, you know, the the conditions and the pitch change more frequently. Right. So, you know, especially later in the day when things get cut up and you might have firm snow here and softer snow there and a mogul here, uh, that's where this really comes in handy. Yeah. And it's just more noticeable. But really cool ski. And kind of like what we discussed with the Basalt, uh, this Rosignol Experience 86 Ti, you know, very similar footprint, a little bit different in the construction. We do get a poplar wood core, two full sheets of metal, uh, but we still get their drive tip solution. Really helpful in filtering out unwanted vibrations. It kind of, this material kind of acts like a radiator uh, when you're, you know, going along and the ski's vibrating. It's really cool. It really just kind of separates out that, those vibrations um, kind of like an, I would say, an analog version of Head's EMC circuit. Yep. Um, and it really works. Uh, you also get carbon alloy matrix in this ski. So just a beefier construction overall. Yeah, but it still has that. Yeah, definitely. And like you can feel it in the stiffness for sure. Yep. Uh, pretty stiff ski. You know, re I think this is very well rounded. Um, similar to what we said on this. It is just a blur between all mountain and front side. The metal really makes it stand out as being damp and powerful. Um, doesn't add a ton to the weight. 1,780 grams uh, in this 176. Uh, and just a, a real pleasure to ski. You know, I would go so far as to say it's my favorite experience, both from an on and off trail perspective. I had a blast in the bumps on these. Yeah, like well, even with the metal. when we first skied them, we were hanging out with the Rosignol rep, I believe, and I took one run on these and said that's the best experience I've ever had on an experience. Yep. The best experience experience. Yeah. And I think and that's, they're, they're super fun. Yeah, that's what they're going for. It's an $850 ski. That, so, so like, <laughs> it, it better be good. <laughs> and this one, this, I would say, caught me off guard more than any others. The when, price? Yeah, when I was going through the written portion this morning. And but I think it, like, price. it's reflective of its performance. I think so, too. Like, it, there yep. is a little bit of sticker shock there, but when you really start to think about it and all the technology in this ski and how good it feels, yep. is, like, it makes sense. Yeah. And, like, the next ski, when you take out the binding, is $900, I'm pretty sure. We'll, we'll take a look at that in yep. a second. But like, there's a lot of similarity. Like, right? Those, yeah, of course, they should be in the same conversation. So it kind of makes sense that this ski is, is that expensive. Yeah. But 
Yeah, it better be good. Right. If you're going to charge $850 for a ski, it better it better be really good. Yeah, and I would have no qualms about skiing this thing any day, every day. You know, sure. this is like one of the first skis on this list that I would that I would gladly take home in a second and Me not too. ski anything else. No. I mean, it is awesome. Uh, just you know, like the basalt, but with that extra layer of performance to it and stability. Yep. But super fast, really clean, and just a great performer overall. Versatile, all mountain carver. Yeah. And psyched that it's back. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. And it, it truly is the best, the best Rossignol experience that's ever existed. <laughs> and like that basalt ski is great too. Yeah. But I, I, you know, when you go from that basalt to the TI, and that's something that I have specifically done, is you ski that TI, and it, like the the thing just sings, yeah. you know. It's it's a very rewarding, yeah, fun ski. Um, and this is too, just in a different way. It is just ski essentials blue. It matches that sign perfectly. Maybe that's why I like it so much. <laughs> so this is the Titan from Head, the Super Shape Titan, or really the Super Shape E Titan, yep. if I want to get the name correct. Um, two sheets of metal in the ski, pretty dense wood core. Yep. You know, they practically build these things like race skis. Like Bob was mentioning, you get that energy management circuit, which like just allows them to put this nice cool graphic <laughs> on there. Um, and I'm sure it's doing something too. We, we joke. Um, but the super shape, if you want to talk about a wide carving ski, yeah. like is, is there a better example of wide carving ski? I, like MX-83 and, and Montero AR at the end there, you could bring those up as, as like, those are also wide carving yeah, skis. Great. But this, I would even say, is like more specific of a carving shape and feel. Yeah. Um, it is stiff. It is strong. It's powerful. And it's pretty much just camber. Like, I think, you know, I'm sure Head calls it tip rocker, but like, is it? I don't know. I don't think so. It's mostly camber. Yep. And then we brought the ski up, I think when we were looking at the RC186 GT, like look at that finish. Yeah. That is a square, flat finish. With a lot of metal. Almost no rocker. And yeah, there's a lot of metal in this ski. Um, so if you are a carving enthusiast and where you ski, the trails often have softer or variable or chopped up snow on them this that's where this ski comes into yep. play it's not really like a beer league racer even though it's such a good carving ski because it's 84 underfoot or 85 underfoot um i think i was right the first time 84. 84 underfoot so it's not like particularly snappy edge to edge but Boy, it's so fun. Talk about complete confidence in a carved turn. Yeah. Like, unflappable. Yeah. This thing is not bouncing at all. I yeah. Mean, you are riding that snow from ed from tip to tail, you know, on that edge. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Somebody took a picture of me on these skis this year, and I looked at that picture, and I was like, I'm not that good at skiing. <laughs> so, like... That's maybe the best compliment that you can give to a ski. Right. Is if it makes you a better skier. And like, I love a ski like this because you can get a super high edge angle. You don't have to worry about booting out or anything like that. And it, it's just strong and rewarding and super fun. And like for some weird way, I could see owning this and the Experience 86 Ti. Yeah, they're that Because they actually different. feel yep. quite a bit different. Um, but like I was saying, like the price is indicative for both of them to how good it is. And this ski, we move up to eight, eight ninety nine or eight eighty nine, eight ninety nine for ski alone. And again, we did a little bit of math there. So, with the binding, we're looking at eleven hundred and fifty dollars now. Yeah. So, you know, we're up there. We have been for a while, but we're up in the premium pricing yeah. category. And you're getting a premium performance. You know, 100%. There's no question. Yep, same thing. If you're going to charge $900 or if you're going to charge $1,150 for ski and binding, it better be pretty darn good. And the Super Shape Titan is yeah. more than pretty darn good. It, it is awesome. And people have, um, in the past, you know, we've done these comparisons for a while now, and people have often pointed out, like, where are the Super Shapes? And right. I'll just take the moment to like say that I'm really happy to have a super shape up here and yeah. they've always been great skis. Sometimes it's just like availability issues, but right. love having a Titan up here and yep. we'll have other super shapes in, in future comparisons. Yeah, that rally was 
One of I my think the rally is your sure. favorite, right? Yeah. I think the Titan might be my favorite. Cool. I just like the extra width. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, yeah, interesting transition. Doesn't really you make know? sense. Nope. And Super Shape Titan to Miras Core. We in the written portion, I mentioned that like we're big fans of outliers. Yep. Here and this is the outlier of the group, By I would say. Far. By far. With like the, and I, you know what? I'm going to use that opportunity to say it is the closest in turn radius to this ski. Okay. So yep. like it belongs up here. It's just very different. Yeah. And just an interesting overall design and shaping concept of this Black Crow's Miras core. Uh, we are in that expensive range though, eight ninety nine ninety five, which is more just like a reflection of Black Crow's. Their like their, yeah, their high end expensive. skis are a thousand dollars, and that's just the way it is. Right. Um, heavier. This is our longer ski on the wall, so nineteen hundred and twenty grams. And I think a lot of it's coming from the length. The length. Weight. Yeah, they do use a poplar wood core. Uh, they have fiberglass laminates and then a metal beam underfoot. So they are getting metal in here, giving you that uh, that stronger finish and torsional stiffness. Um, but as you mentioned, Jeff, we are looking at a short turn radius. Very. So 13, is yep. that what it is? Yep. 13 meters in this 184. Yep. Uh, pretty crazy. And they do that by just having this incredibly round, uh, rounded off side cut. You know, so it's really just an interesting build of a ski uh, with a fairly symmetrical tip and tail profile. Yeah. So, you know, interesting things going on here. We get their little fish tail thing going on. That's adding to the smoothness and then the flex and the playfulness in the back. Yeah. Uh, just a, a, a whole different ski than what we see uh, from other stuff up here. And it's, you know, you were flexing it. It's, got some stiffness to it. It's it got does. some pop. Yep. Um, but, you know, I think that people that are looking at, for something unique, like a Liberty, uh, that this takes it to the next level. So using this ski as a combination, free ride, park, carving ski, yep. all mountain ski, like this is designed for that purpose. Like how much can you fit into a ski? Uh, I think that they've that's what that's what their goal was here, and I think they're pretty effective. Yeah, I'd really like to own one. Yep. I think I probably will eventually, um, because there's just nothing else like it. It's kind of like the line blade, right? And like it's pretty hard to like talk about in these comparisons because it's so unique, but it's really really fun. So yeah, I, it's like hard to like sort of make recommendations for that ski, and and maybe the best recommendation is. If you like own a bunch of other stuff already yep. and you just want something different, like you want to add a ski to your quiver, you just don't know like where to fit one in, this will fit into anyone's ski quiver because right. you do not own anything like it. Yeah, it's a very, very specific combination of things. Yeah. Like 87 millimeter waist, 13 meter turn yep. radius, fishtail. Right. You know, symmetrical rocker. Like it's right. just a very interesting blend of things. Totally. So you're not getting anything like it anywhere else <laughs> no um, and the next ski we have up here is the vocal deacon v works so we'll probably get through this one pretty quickly i think because there's a ton of similarities between this ski and the deacon 84. Um, we're just basically getting lighter construction in this ski yep. and more technology which is reflected in the price so this is the first ski that by our math, we're over $1,000 for ski alone, so we're $1,030. You get it with the binding, and you're looking at $1,300. So, you know, that's a considerable jump up in price from the Deacon 84. Do you need the Deacon V-Works? It's up to you. Do you want this performance in a lighter weight package is how I'm looking at it. Yeah, and like, do you have that room in your budget? Right. Like. You know, we're starting to get up into like a pretty expensive world here, and I could totally understand not wanting to spend thirteen hundred dollars on your skis and bindings. Right. And if you don't want to, the Deacon eighty four is going to provide right. very similar performance. In fact, to the point where I've skied them back to back, and they're more similar than different, in my opinion. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I do think this ski has uh, more accessible energy. 
Yeah. Which makes sense given its construction. You know, we got more carbon in these skis, and and there's some there's some funny um, similarities between this ski and other skis that Vocal makes. So we get like the carbon tip up here, yep. but we also get kind of like um, blaze construction. Right. Like the wood core is. Wood is, core is a blaze. Right. Yeah. And then we get like Deacon Master tips and. I don't know. Yeah. Vocals, like, you could probably do a, a whole two hour long video just discussing all of Vocal's different construction techniques and, like, how they use them in different skis, which I think is really cool. But that's the big difference between this ski and the Deacon 84 is lighter construction, more technology. They're kind of just, they're taking a ski that's already really good and giving you, like, the, the premium version of that ski. Yeah. But essentially everything that we said about the Deacon 84 carries over to this ski as well. I think of it like bike components where you're going from like right. AX to AXS or whatever yeah. that comparable thing is where you're getting a, a better thing for lighter weight. Right. Or like maybe you ride a $6,000 mountain bike, which isn't even that crazy these days. Right. Like, that's how I think of the Deacon 84. Yeah. Maybe you ride a $6,000 mountain bike and you upgrade it to a carbon wheel set. That's how I think about this ski. Yeah. And like, yeah, if you've got the budget for that kind of stuff, it's going to be a little bit better. But a lot of things are better when you spend more money on yeah. them. So <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a it's 100% the consumer decision at that point, yeah. whether it's worth it to you. And that's a conversation that comes up a lot with the next three skis and particularly those two brands that we have in these next three skis is we get that question a lot like is it worth it right and like that's that's not a question that we can answer because everyone's financial situation is different right like, i don't know there's too many factors involved to for us to answer the question of worth exactly but yeah um you know when you get into Kessley range, you're certainly looking at that upper level of precision, quality of construction, and overall engineering that goes into the ski. So this FX86 Ti uh, is the narrowest of the FX line. So we're kind of counter what we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So this is that narrower free ride ski put into this all mountain package. Uh, pretty awesome. 1800 grams. This is the 180, 185. Um, so a little bit longer, does have two sheets of metal. They use denser wood stringers in the middle and then lighter wood stringers on the outside. So they are putting that stuff together in order to create an effect of stability in the middle and then playfulness on the outside. Yeah. And it works. And it works well when combined with hollow tech and when combined with this, uh, you know, the tip taper and rocker shape. So we do see a little bit of rocker there. Uh, but more of that spoony taper shape. So definitely that lower taper, widest part of the ski is down here. Certainly contrasts to what we see when we get into the mid-range of the MX line. Yep. And then in the tail, it's not that metal squared off shape like we see in MX. It's certainly more of that free ride inspired, uh, you know, more plasticky goodness with that skin notch in it. So yeah, is it the only ski with a skin notch? Probably. Well, Unless you count that navigator. Yeah, weirdly, there's one on the navigator, <laughs> so nope. <laughs> but it comes with a system alpine binding, right. so Not why much. is that there? I don't know. You put your alpine trekkers in there. And <laughs> well, that's a great idea. A <laughs> We're going to go touring on some Navigator 85s this season. Um, but yeah, 86 underfoot, 17.6 meter turn radius. That's pretty short for a free ride inspired ski like this. Uh, so it does turn really well uh, in our testing and feedback, uh, tons of, you know, positive feedback from a mogul perspective. So great bump ski, come out back on the groomers and you're ripping carved turns. Yep. So great blend of those attributes in this ski, really well-rounded. Yep. Is it worth it? I don't know. It's up to you. Yep. It's pretty interesting looking at the MX-83, our next ski, compared to the FX-86 in some ways there are some similarities you know you were mentioning that's the narrowest ski in a free ride line yep this isn't quite the narrowest ski but it is one of the narrower skis in the mx line um, but i just feel like all of the mx skis even the widest mx skis still feel more like carving focused skis they're so, substantial 
Well, it's not like it's a narrower free ride. <laughs> right. Ski. We're still in a carving focused shape and, and performance in this ski. Um, we go up $100, so we were $1,100 in that FX86 Ti. Now we're up to $1,200 or, or really $1,199. Yep. Um, but really, really cool ski. And basically the, the big difference between a ski like the FX86 and this ski is we get a little bit denser construction. We get two full sheets of metal in this ski. You know, Bob talked about kind of the difference in the the density or the different density wood used in that yep. FX ski. There's not really anything put into this ski to make it more forgiving or compliant. Right. I guess you could maybe bring up the Holotech and the carbon up here. But this is designed to be a stiff, powerful, highly responsive, highly precise ski. Yeah. You know, we really don't get much tip rocker in here at all. We're pretty much looking at a full cambered ski. Um, and like we were looking at in that Titan, a very flat, squared off tail here. Maybe not quite as flat or squared off as the Titan, but not far off either. And very metallic. Oh yeah, there's a lot yeah. of metal in this ski. Yep. Yeah, and I actually, I really love the way that they finish off this yep. tail. It is, it looks like it's just pretty much all metal. Yeah. Um, so, I think this ski is awesome. Super, super rewarding as a carving ski. 16.3 meter turn radius in this 175, so it's going to make a nice round carving turn shape. It's not like a race ski, because we're 80, 83 under foot here. Right. But I like skis this wide, and I think we talked about that with the Titan. You don't have to worry about booting out. You can get really high edge angles, and they're, to me, they're very, very, very rewarding as carving skis. Yep. Like if you're not worried about racing or like how fast you're going or like shaving seconds off in a race course and you just want like the emotional reaction to carving, like it's, it's hard to do much better than this ski. No, and that was my initial impression from back when it was the MX-84. Yeah. And we skied on it however many years ago thinking, wow, those are the cleanest and roundest turns I have ever made. Right. Like. Not a question in my mind when I got down to the bottom after my first run on the MX-84 was like feeling pretty good about myself. Right. <laughs> you know, like, right. No, kind of like, how you were reacted to the Titan. Yeah, or the um, wingman like makes you feel like a better yeah. skier. Like, yeah, there's yeah. a lot. And I think that the 16.3 meter turn radius or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that helps a lot too, like having that slightly shorter turn radius. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of people kind of thinking about this ski in comparison to the next ski, the Montero. I just find this to be a little stiffer. Yeah. And it's like weird because I think that's it comes across more when you're skiing them than when you're like hand flexing them in a ski shop or something like that. This feels, especially out of the tail, it feels stiffer and, and kind of like there's more, more power in how it finishes the very end of a carve where I think Stokely did a good job kind of building a little bit more versatility into the Montero. Yeah, I think they did that a couple different ways, and that's a good transition here. So new fiberglass in this one, so making it a little bit stiffer. Exactly, yeah. And then, as you mentioned, the denser wood core. And this kind of goes a little bit the opposite way. Right, they so use the lighter core. Lighter core. We still get two sheets of metal in this Montero AR. Yep. Um, but we don't have that that stiffness, like the pinginess of the fiberglass that we see in the Kessley. Um, so it just... Yeah, and like I said, like hand flexing them, it, it feels about the same. About the but same. But for some reason when you ski them, yeah. this just feels softer. Yeah, a little bit, you know, so they just kind of do it a different way. Um, you know, this one is just a little bit more quiet, a little bit more compliant. Um, 2,050 grams, so pretty heavy. Uh, that Kessley has a demo plate on it. It right, comes right. flat, um, so n not much use putting that in the scale. But no. um, I'd imagine it's pretty similar. Um, but great new ski, you know, more of an update than a new ski. Uh, the Laser AR to this, you know, anyone looking for a monumental difference is going to be somewhat disappointed uh, or excited, depending on how you felt about that Laser AR. Uh, but you know, an extra millimeter underfoot, um, just a little bit different in lengths and turn shapes, uh, but same overall construction and feel and performance. 
So I like the changes because it puts this ski in a 185, which I enjoy. Yep. Uh, this is the 180, um, but and this is the one that I skied, and it was great. Yep. No issues going down five centimeters on a ski like this. Uh, and just a ton of shape in this thing. Um, really excellent camber. Uh, anytime you're putting that amount of camber in a ski of this quality, you're going to get that energy. Um, you certainly feel the tail. Uh, very strong, very squared off, uh, you know, pretty reactive, you know, saying that it's a little bit more flexible like in the hand flex, you know, flies a little bit against the, the feel on the back end of this ski where it really kicks you out of a turn. Um, so not one to get in the back seat on, but a little bit more accessible in the front, the front portion of the ski. Yeah. But really just nice entry into the turn. Uh, and about as high quality and precise of a ski as you're going to get for being as friendly and welcoming as it is. And so, $1,350. Yeah. So it better be really good. It better be really good. And it, it's really good. <laughs> yeah. Like we don't talk about like objective performance in skis very often. We try and make it very subjective yeah. and like, you know, kind of point out who is going to enjoy a ski more than another person or which ski is going to work best for you as a skier yeah. and a lot of time people will comment particularly on these comparisons and say like sometimes angrily like which one's best right like why don't you just tell me what the best ski is and like sure it's this one yeah <laughs> but it's also thirteen hundred and fifty dollars right so it's yeah. not best for it, everybody it better be the yeah. best right and then like also yeah, like a skier where like a skier who should be choosing this, right? That is not the best ski for you, right? But sure, if you want to just like, <laughs> if you want to, if you want our assessment of the best ski on this wall, it, it's to me, it's got to be that one. And this also brings up another fun conversation of would you have a bent eighty five and a right. Miris Core or and a Rosignol Experience right. eighty six? Like that's Right. It's just fun to point out that there's yeah, that much Yeah, if you've got $1,350 to spend on skis, yeah. should you just get a Montero AR? Right. I don't know. It's not that simple. Right. You get two very different skis You could get for three skis. Like, yeah. You get a lot of skis. Yeah. But, but it is <laughs> undeniably really, really, really good. Yeah. Very impressive what they do over there at Stokely. And, you know, we're excited to see, you know, this new, new-ish shape and then filters down into AX as well, kind of getting that same treatment. But, yep, and we'll talk about that in another yep. comparison. But really, really fun and just as smooth as smooth can be. Yep. Um, and a great ski to end on. Yep. So that's it. That was 24. It's a lot of skis. Yeah. 24 <laughs> skis in the mid-80 range. A lot of different stuff up here. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Um, I think it's just fun giving this category attention. Because yep. this is like, we could easily just skip this category and I don't think anybody would get mad at us. But I, I feel pretty strongly that there are a lot of really good skis up here and that, I don't know, in a lot of ways this should probably be the most popular category of skis, but it doesn't feel like that comes through in sales numbers. No, and the fact that you're getting such quality on your end there. I got you know, the value. Wall. You got the value, whether, awesome. you know, Maverick, Stance, yeah. you know, the Dina Star, when you're going, you know, looking at skis $600 and under, like, that's an amazing value. Totally. Yeah. So, pretty cool. Um, that's it. That's our 2023 mid-80 ski comparison. As always, let us know if you have any questions. We're more than happy to, to talk more about these oh, yeah. skis or... or clarify any differences that you might be more curious about. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.